Warning. This work of fiction, intended for adults, contains strong language and graphic depictions of violence. Discretion advised. The Ballad of the Flower, Book One, Druid. Written and performed by Neil Meyer. Chapter One. The morning came, as it had yesterday, and the day before that, all the way back for twenty-two years. The light from the sun was weaker than usual, bright summer yellow turning to autumn gold, but nevertheless it woke Terra. Terra stretched into the air above her bed, the cold pricking her fingers a bit. She sat up, moved the fur blankets around, and swung her feet onto the floor. She took in her cramped little room, an offshoot of a cramped little house that was forced into the trunk of a very large tree. As she moved to the main room, she traced the carvings in the walls, stories the bog had told her when she was small, the history of her teachers and of the world itself. There was the first druid, Altrix, ascending to godhood. Here was Prevella Treestrider, who made peace with the dryads. On and on and on. She made an effort to avoid the carvings on the other side of the room, the strange, abstract figures that depicted the war that priests had waged on her people. Even after seeing it day after day and night after night, it made her shiver to think what would happen if the priests ever caught her. When she was younger, she'd had nightmares about the little carvings coming to life and attacking her. She would cry so loudly that Bog would have to sing to her to get her back to sleep. She looked away. In the main room, which functioned as a kitchen, library, guest room, and anything else they needed, was a large oak slab that still held dishes from last night's dinner. She carefully stepped over Bog, who was asleep in his shell on the floor, and began to clean up. Since it was only the two of them, there was hardly any mess. Two bowls washed, she thought to herself. She took the empty bucket by the door with her to the pond. She filled it with water before taking in her own reflection. Bog said that it was good to be familiar with yourself, that way you know when something is wrong. Her hair was still black and frizzy, her skin was still tanned, and her eyes still had bags under them. She looked over her plain face and, finding nothing wrong with it, she let her reflection disappear as her hands broke the water's surface. She washed her face and brought the water inside. There was plenty of sunlight now, and she could see the row of books above the fireplace were in need of some dusting. She sorted them and moved back to her room to get dressed for the day. After picking out a set of hand-sewn pants and work clothes, she went to the garden. It was small and mainly for alchemical ingredients, but the few vegetables that were there always needed weeds pulled. With a snap of her fingers, the undesirable plants seemed to wither away, leaving a thriving, healthy garden. A few years prior, she would have actually had to pull the weeds, but Bog had deemed her studied enough to learn some basic spells. She enjoyed magic. It made her feel connected to nature, even more than she usually did. There was something about the power one felt from nature actually paying attention to you. Tara stretched out in the morning sun. The grass was soft underneath her, and it was early enough in the season for the leaves to change but not fall. The birds were bickering again. Too many birds, not enough seeds, all that. But it was good to just listen to the conversations. All she could see was the orange glow through her eyelids. Tara? The voice was slow and deep, drawn out in the worst kind of drawl. I'm out here, Bog, Tara said, not moving. She needed to get all the warmth that she could. What do you need? She heard the walking stick, the slow, hobbled steps coming closer. Finished already? Bog stretched his long neck down. Tara could sense his odd reptilian eyes on her. Yeah, Bog, I finished like an hour ago. I've been doing the same chores for twelve years. Hmm. Bog seemed to rattle as he sighed. Ah, oh, the haste of youth, he said. To be a hatchling once more. His voice drifted off. He stared into the distance for a few seconds, then carried on. I think I'll go for a walk, he said. Okay, Bog, be safe. Tara still hadn't moved. There were only so many hours of sun left in the year. She was going to use every one of them. As Bog slowly moved away, eventually out of earshot, Tara focused on her breath. The smells of the woods were just as important as the sights and sounds. The ground under her was beginning to dry out for the winter. She could smell the red lilies that she tended to in Bog's pond. The wind often carried new information to her, predators, hurt creatures, the occasional intruder or customer. 
Too long, she thought. Too long since she'd spoken to another human. Bog was an excellent teacher, of course, but terrible conversation. And lately, her lessons had been slowing down. She was learning advanced druid craft, supremely difficult natural magic, but with no one to practice on. It was all only theory. Hours went by as she breathed in and out. Her meditations were interrupted by a scurrying sound. Tara felt tiny paws crawl up her leg and onto her chest. Rapid squeaks crowded her ears. What? Slow down. Who stole your food? She didn't need to open her eyes to recognize a chipmunk. The squeaks came again. All right, all right. I'll go talk to him. Where is he? She sat up and stretched out her arms. The chipmunk had latched onto her tangled black hair and was now on her head. Yes, I know, I know, she kept replying, trying to calm the chipmunk down. I'll get your acorns back. Sheesh. She moved past the pond, past the tree that had been her home since she could remember, and towards the direction the chipmunk had indicated. Do you think maybe this could be something you work on, I don't know, without my help? There were squeaks and a clawing at her head. Ow, fine! Forget I said anything! Away from her clearing, she found a maple tree with a deep hollow inside. Squirrel, get out here! No response. I can smell you in there, Squirrel. Don't make this harder than it has to be. There was a scuttering in the hollow. No, just... Uh, did you steal acorns? Angry squeaks came from inside the tree. Whoa, there's no need for that. I'm just trying to solve a problem. The squirrel finally showed himself, screeching loudly. Hey, either give the acorns back or I'll take them. The rodents suddenly ran off. Tara looked around for a cause and saw a large horned owl in the tree. Her eyes narrowed. You aren't one of mine, she said, just to confirm it with the bird. The owl cocked its head and silently took off. It flew south, away from her clearing. She took a step towards it. This could be dangerous. A trap. Or a customer. She took another step forward. Her curiosity was getting the better of her. This was exactly what Bog warned her about. Temper those feelings with caution. She would approach quietly. She would stay away until she knew more. That was a good compromise. She took a deep breath and moved quickly in the direction the owl flew. She only got a few feet before she heard a call. A very human call. She was too far away to hear the words, but she was getting closer, running now. Someone help! My friend is hurt! It was a man. Mittens found someone. She's up there. Another voice, younger. Please, can you help my friend? The older voice said, yelling in Tara's direction. She could see them now. Two men carrying a body. They were all covered in blood, and part of the body looked like it was missing. Tara supposed she could help bury it, but that might be all. She stepped out of the cover of the woods. I think your friend might be dead, she said softly. She approached the two men like she would a starving animal. They were an unknown. No, he's alive, please. You have to help him. Can you help him? The older man said, shambling towards her and carrying the corpse. His eyes were bloodshot. He'd been fighting something. He was bleeding from a few scrapes on his face and arms. You're hurt. I can fix up your cuts, but your friend is... The corpse twitched. Tara let out a startled yelp and backed away. It, no, he, wasn't breathing. His eyes were desperately searching for something. The only thing that had slowed the bleeding was the fact that he had lost so much blood. Holy shit, he's alive, Tara said. Put him down, you can't move him like this. She helped the older man set the body on the ground. Tara looked at the two men. Give me your shirt, she said to the younger one. He was wearing a few layers, he wouldn't miss this one. She wrapped the soft gray garment around the large gash across the patient's torso. As she was looking, she saw that the ribcage was amazingly intact. The organs seemed to be in all the wrong spots, though. This would be ugly. What happened? She said, making sure the wrap was tight. He got attacked by an owlbear, the older one said, catching his breath. He got really beat up. Is he going to be okay? Tara couldn't hide the uncertainty on her face. Not like this. Can you carry him a bit further? Tara said. The older man steadied himself, and Tara could see that his frame was fairly muscular. Yeah, I've got him. Where are we going? He asked, putting his hands under the body. Up the hill and over a ways. I have a place I can take care of him. Tara took the lead, wiping some blood on her pants. As they ran, she called to a robin, chattering above her. Hey, go find Bog. Tell him we have company. As they moved forward, she spotted the large owl again, eyeing her suspiciously. They reached the clearing, and Tara had them set the body down on the large wooden table inside her tree. What's his name? Tara said, 
hastily unwrapping the cloth. What? The older man looked incredulous. What's his name? I need to talk to him. Do you want him to live or not? His name is Adam, the younger man finally said. His voice shook a bit when he spoke. Thank you. Adam? Adam, can you hear me? Tara looked through the small pouch on her hip, trying to find the right berry. Adam gave an eerie sound. Hey there, Adam. I'm Tara. I need you to eat this berry. It's going to put you to sleep, okay? Tara took a small black berry from her pouch. Open his mouth, she said to the older man. She watched his face contort as he gently pulled Adam's lips apart. You, she turned to the younger. There's a pond outside with red lilies. Get me mud from where their roots are. Bring me a bucketful. There's one near the door. The younger man moved quickly without saying anything. The wound was completely exposed now. There was hardly any blood left in him. Everything inside his body was relatively intact, but arranged all wrong, like someone who had a vague notion of squishy bits go inside the ribs had been given free reign to design a body. She washed her hands in the water bucket. You're not going to want to watch this, she said to the older man. It's going to get a little graphic. If he heard her, he didn't care. She got to work. Organs were probably her least favorite part of healing. Natural magic could do a lot, but actually moving things around took some elbow grease, as Bog put it. For Tara, it was the sounds. The wet, sopping, squishing sound as things shifted around inside of someone was almost unbearable. She was used to blood, and crying, and whining, but when a patient was unconscious, there was no resistance. Just innards. When an organ was in the right spot, more or less, she kept it in place with the mud from her pond. Owl bears had spit that caused infection, and the roots would draw that out, as well as help keep everything from moving around. She set the two strangers, the older, Carson, and the younger, Barney, to work, keeping a supply of cool water over Adam's forehead. Fever was natural, of course, but Tara needed control while she was manipulating a body like this. Cooler was better. The sun began to set. Tara asked Carson to light the small candles around her room, but instead Barney summoned some sort of magical lights around her. They were much brighter than her candles, and when she found that she could move them easily with her hand, she set them at appropriate spots over Adam's body. She would check his eyes every now and again, making sure he was dreaming. His brown eyes flitted everywhere, searching but seeing nothing. Even as she finished, he looked much too thin. His muscles were lean like someone who ran a lot. The definition of his stomach was indiscernible, as Tara had been messing around in his abdomen for the better part of four hours. With the last few stitches, she sat back on a creaky chair that was older than she was. She leaned her head back and groaned. He would live. Probably. Carson came in with a bucket of water. Is he okay? He asked. He's stable, at least. I need to watch him tonight. He's going to be in a lot of pain when he wakes up, Tara said. Barney was asleep in the armchair across the room. When is he going to wake up, do you think? Carson asked, walking to Adam's side. Let's hope it takes as long as possible. That's going to hurt. Tara hadn't even bothered to sit up yet. Her fingers still felt slick and they ached with fatigue. Owlbear, huh? She asked Carson. Yeah, it ran out at us. Adam got in its way. Carson was locked on Adam. Let me take a look at those scratches. I don't want you getting infected. Tara stood slowly and moved to Carson. She had to reach up to take his chin in her hands. His jaw was strong, his cheekbones high. His dark hair had dirt and blood in it, but it stayed up out of his eyes. He definitely wasn't from around here. His skin was darker than Adam's, but nowhere near the sable of Barney's. It reminded Tara of acorns. She tilted his head around, examining the scratches and bruises. She grabbed a lily bulb from the bucket, washed off the mud, and began to chew it. Carson's deep brown eyes watched her carefully. She spat the chewed-up bulb into her hand and smeared it over a cut above his jaw. Carson made a face. Great. I feel much better, he said through his teeth. Tara heard his stomach growl. She felt her own hunger, too, which she had been beating down during the procedure. Shit, I don't have a ton of food here. Tara began to look around. Start a fire in the pit and get some water boiling. You can boil water, right? She looked at Carson, who glared at her through the green paste on his cheek. I'll manage, he seemed to growl, but he got to starting a fire. Tara, in the meantime, went outside. The air was cool on her face. She didn't realize how hard she'd been working. 
she looked at the small garden that Bog had kept since she was a little girl. She'd need a lot of vegetables to feed four. She pulled a single carrot out of the ground and held it in her hand. She concentrated, breathing in as much air as she could before letting out a deep sigh. She felt her hands grow warm, an almost ticklish feeling, and a deep green light came from the carrot. She quickly looked around. It would be fairly obvious to anyone that she was a druid by now, but there was no reason to give them any hard evidence. When she was inside, she began to chop up the vegetable. Thankfully, her spell had worked, and as she chopped, the carrot regrew itself rapidly. She set the chunks into the boiling water. There's some rabbit in the pantry, that shelf there, she said to Carson. He brought it to her. Where are the three of you from? She asked, once she'd gotten everything into the pot. Out of town, Carson said. Tara felt her stomach sink. It seemed she'd have to wait a while longer for some human interaction. I hear they have great weather over there, Tara said in a last-ditch effort to keep the conversation going. Carson just sat and looked at Adam. Staring at him won't help, she said. She'd been around grieving families before. It was unfortunate that they were always allowed so close. Carson just kept looking. What would she want if Bog had been hurt? She'd be feeling powerless. She'd want something to do. She took notice of the weapons on Carson, a mean-looking sword and a round shield. Hey, do you want to go stand watch, maybe? Tara offered. Carson looked surprised, but then seemed to understand. Yeah, yeah, I'll go set up a perimeter. He was tall enough to touch the ceiling if he wanted to. He stood and went outside. Tara took a few moments to stir the soup, then sat next to Adam. She could probably fix the scar when he was more stable. She was desperate to try some new techniques. She was tracing the stitches when a pale hand grabbed her wrist hard. Carson, Adam said. He was trying to yell, but he didn't have enough air. Tara fought the urge to pull her hand away. Is Carson safe? The brown eyes were focused now. They seemed to glow as Adam took stock of the room. Y yes he's safe. You saved him. He's outside. I can go get him. Tara tried to stay calm, but the grip on her wrist was surprisingly strong. Adam relaxed a bit, sighing and breathing shallowly. No, no, not yet. Adam looked around, his head staying still. His chest seemed to strain with the effort of breathing. His eyes found Tara's. I'm Adam. He tried to raise a hand, but decided against it. I'm Tara, she said. You saved me. His words only came when he was already exhaling. Tara nodded and rubbed her newly freed wrist. Thank you, he managed a weak smile. You're a druid, aren't you? Tara's face must have replied for her because he immediately changed tact. No, no, you're safe. I mean, we aren't exactly priests. His smile showed again. How's Carson? Is Barney here too? Barney is asleep. I think Carson is still really worried, Tara said. She was still uneasy from his druid comment. Adam sighed and winced in pain. Okay, if they say anything, anything that makes you feel unsafe, stay close to me, Adam said confidently. It was difficult to take him seriously, seeing as he was now mostly mud and a few steps from being in a grave. Tara nodded to make him more comfortable. All right, get Carson in here. I need to make him feel better. Adam rolled his eyes. Tara poked her head out of the tree trunk. He's awake, she said. She heard metal clinking as Carson ran to the door. He almost crashed past her to get into the room. Adam, Adam, are you okay? Carson was staring. It looked like he was keeping himself from touching Adam. He fiddled with his hands. Carson, I need you to be honest with me, Adam said. His voice had a new tinge of exhaustion. I don't know how much time I have. His voice was breathy and melodramatic. Carson didn't notice. Of course, yeah, anything, buddy. Carson seemed to be panicking. Adam slowly reached up a hand to Carson's chest, and Carson took it in his own. It didn't get my face, did it? We can't both be ugly. Adam had cracked a large smile full of teeth. Carson dropped Adam's hand and turned away. His hands turned into fists. You jackass, Carson yelled. He looked torn between smacking Adam and letting him recover. Why would you get in the way like that? The yelling stirred Barney from his sleep, and he stood on the other side of the table. You know I can take a hit better than you can. I would have been fine. Carson was somewhere between talking and yelling that Tara wasn't used to. Are you all right, Adam? Barney said quietly. I'm a little beat up, but I'm going to be okay. Thanks, Barney. 
Adam looked at him warmly. Now I have to send a report, Carson continued. The boss is going to wonder why we're so behind schedule. We can't move you like this, so we've definitely missed the connection with our muscle. Carson was trying to pace, but the room was so crowded that he could only spin in a circle. Do you need anything? Barney asked. Some water would be amazing, actually. Thank you, Adam said softly. His smile had shrunk, but it was still there. I don't even think I can get a refund on these tickets. Carson had stopped yelling at Adam and started yelling to himself. Now we need to find new muscle, get different tickets to the colonies. I'm not made of money, you guys, and there's no way to write incompetence on an expense report. Barney had brought some water to Adam's side. He struggled to sit up, and Tara had to stop him. No, you don't, she put a hand on his chest. You stay right there. I'm not going to do any more stitching today. She got a clean cloth and dripped water into Adam's mouth. Carson had taken a break from pacing to work on the soup. This is going to go on my record. How am I ever going to get another job after this? He ranted under his breath. Gotta pay for the boat, gotta pay the healer. This is all coming out of your share. Some broth spilled as he stirred angrily. Dinner is ready, he finally said, still grumbling. You let Carson cook? Adam whispered to Barney. I sleep when I get stressed out, you know that, he whispered back. I did the cooking, Tara added, trying to match the tone of their conversation. The two of them nodded at her. She couldn't help but smile. The soup was fine. For short notice, it was almost impressive. It had been years since anyone had brought spices to trade for healing, and she only had enough for a truly special occasion. Despite Tara's advice, Adam had begun sitting up. He wasn't allowed off the table, but she took the opportunity to clean it one section at a time. Carson had taken Barney's spot in the armchair, and Barney seemed comfortable on the floor, reading some of the books from the shelf. Tara was glad she had dusted. That's totally ironic, Adam said. Rabbits and carrots in the same stew? Definitely irony. He was gesturing with a spoon. No, it isn't, Carson said. He was rubbing a bruise on his arm. It's funny, yeah. Well, not funny, but humorous, I guess. Not irony. But rabbits eat carrots, Adam said. It was probably as loud as he could get, but it was still quiet. They'd love a carrot stew, but they're in the carrot stew. How is that not irony? They both looked at Barney. Not irony in the traditional sense, but modern definitions and uses are always changing, Barney said without looking up. See, I'm right, Adam said, smiling. He just said it's not irony. Carson was getting more frustrated. If you weren't already half dead. Yeah, but modern definitions are changing all the time, Adam countered. So I'm right, because if I say I'm right often enough, I will be. Tara saw a wide grin on Adam's face. He wasn't bad looking when he had all of his guts in him. That's not how things work, Carson leapt out of his chair. Truth is real. Truth is bendable, Adam seemed to scoff, waving a hand as if dismissing an imaginative child. Carson charged the table. I swear to the gods, if you... The door opened, and the tension went from argument to stance. Carson had drawn his sword, Marnie had sprung to his feet, and Adam laid down to make himself a smaller target. Bog walked in. His walking stick clicked when it made contact with the wood of the floor. Company, he said, his drawl grotesque. Tara looked at the faces of the others. Barney had a quizzical look. Adam seemed pleasantly surprised. Carson looked baffled. To be fair, seeing a large, three-foot-tall turtle that stood on two legs and spoke was probably not the easiest thing to deal with. Bog entered, seemingly unaware of the dangers these strangers posed. Welcome to my home, Bog said plainly. So sorry I was not here to greet you properly. His sing-song voice had charmed Adam and apparently pissed Carson off. No one moved as Bog stepped closer to the table. How are you feeling, young man? he asked. Adam was smiling broadly. I am just so great right now. Adam kept his mouth open and was shaking his head in disbelief. Excellent, excellent, Bog said, moving forward into the now claustrophobic space. No swords in the house, please, Bog said to Carson, who warily sheathed his weapon. Bog reached Barney and inspected him for a moment. Ah, uh, he crooned, a wayfinder. Bog stretched out a scaly arm to Barney and wrapped his claws around the human's forearm. Tell me, Bog said, leaning in conspiratorially. Are you here for your trials? One of Bog's eyes narrowed. Oh, no, sir, Barney managed. I finished my trials two years ago. Bog slowly shook hands with Barney. 
My belated congratulations, Bog sighed, his voice arpeggiating wildly. Your people's traditions and mine are one and the same. Bog released his claws. Tara noticed Carson staring. I believe, Bog continued, I have some maps around here for trade, should you be interested. Barney looked bewildered. I'd appreciate that, sir. My name is Barnabas Winsett. My friends call me Barney. Barney, Bog said, overjoyed. A pleasure, a pleasure. My name is Bog. Bog gave a toothless smile. I trust that these are your associates? Bog gestured a claw at the other two. Yes, Barney said sheepishly. This is Carson, and on the table is Adam. Adam gave a smile, but Carson stuck with his disbelieving look. Charmed. Bog bent his neck low. I shall return with maps just a moment. The four of them watched Bog move slowly, slowly through the room, open the door, and exit. Barney, what the fuck was that? Carson said as soon as the door had closed. Oh, that's a turtle, sir. Turtle person, Barney said. Friend of yours? Carson asked Tara. Mentor, really, Tara said. Is he always so... Deliberate? Carson asked. Tara could see he was doing his best to be polite. Honestly, I've never seen him more excited, Tara replied. God, it's like talking to decaf, Carson said. I love him so much, Adam said from the table. If he has maps, I'm definitely trading with him, Barney said. Tara had gone from craving conversation to being overwhelmed. This was more than she had heard in probably a year, talking to Bog included. These three seemed to talk constantly, and one of them didn't even have full control over his lungs. Tara seemed to shrink into her chair, content to listen to these human birds chirping. Barney, can you get a message to the boss? Carson was giving Adam a once-over. Tell her we hit a snag, and we're going to need to find new muscle. We'll get back on the road when Adam is ready. I'm ready now, Carson, Adam said, his shallow breathing making him painfully quiet. Yeah, no, you're not. Carson put a hand on Adam's shoulder. Tara, can we stay here for the night? It took Tara a second to come out of herself. Adam isn't moving for at least two days. You're more than welcome to camp outside. She stood out of habit. She didn't want them to leave just yet. It was a strange feeling, wanting solitude and company at the same time. Bog returned with a string of turtle shells in his hand. Here we are, Bog said. Carson covered his mouth. Allow me to explain the reading of these maps. In the cramped space, Boggs' voice seemed even more song-like. Within a few moments, Barney and Bog were talking. Countries came up that Tara had never heard of. Their words faded into a fog that Tara's brain refused to comprehend. The fatigue in her hands had spread to her whole body. Carson and Adam were talking now, too. Simple conversations about pain and responsibility. A general discussion of who owed who. Tara watched them smile at each other. She felt herself smile, too, a little bit at her handiwork. It was a miracle that Adam had survived, but also at how they moved around each other. She thought about her own movements before the fog of exhaustion overtook her. End of chapter.